Today is Friday, November 13th, 2009. My name is Frida Reitman, and it's my pleasure to interview today Vicki Benjamin at her home in Stamford as part of the Oral History Archive of the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County. I have been looking forward to this day. I think we should start by talking about your family. Would you tell us a little about your parents and where they came from and where they were living when you were born? Uh, yes. My parents, Julius Davis, my father, and my mother, Florence Brandis Davis, uh, were childhood sweethearts. My uh, father's mother and her sister ran a Kucheline, a boarding house, as a hobby, as fun, in Red Bank, New Jersey. Uh, I think that the two husbands had bought it up at an auction. <laughs> so um, who should arrive one wonderful summer than um, my mother's family from Brooklyn? And so, uh, in, did I say Red Bank? It's Long Branch. And so my father, who was maybe in City College at the time, or maybe a freshman at medical school, he met my mother, who was 16. And so they knew one another, and uh, I, I guess became lovers, even though they uh, were in love with one another, even though one lived in, in Brooklyn. And um, my my father's mother lived on the lower, parents lived on the lower east side, where my grandma had a business uh, with her sister. Uh, they were, um, the whole family, all of the sisters, put one another in the same business, which was called dry goods. And there was needles, threads, corsets, I hear, and uh, all kinds of different clothing or sheets. Uh, I'm not sure. And uh, they all lived. They all lived, it's not the Lower East Side either, my, it was Yorkville that my uh, father's mother had her business. So the women were working. The women were working, and the men weren't working as hard. <laughs> my oh. grandpa went to the track, and you know, uh, every Friday afternoon he'd come home and say, Mozzie dear, I've been robbed. <laughs> so he wouldn't have as much money to bring. Now, your father was born in the United States, and your mother came as a very young child. Yes, she was, she was a baby, under a year old, one of seven children, and she came to this country uh, as an infant. Do you have some childhood memories that you would like to uh, contribute? Well, I had a wonderful, a wonderful childhood. Uh, I had a privileged childhood. I think mostly because my parents loved one another. I don't suppose in my whole life uh, I've met more than one or two couples who even slightly resemble the relationship that they had. Um, so that made it privileged. Um, my father was a, a serious, studious uh, man. Uh, as a physician, he studied on his own and uh, got diplomate, uh, which, is a, which is an advanced degree, uh, in two specialties. One was dermatology, uh, and the other was um, I'm not sure really what it's called, but a specialty where he uh, was able to work at Washburn Wire doing taking care of people who had been badly cut or injured, or I think it was called traumatic surgery, was the, was the second diplomate. He was always studying at the Academy of Medicine, always reading the latest journals, and a uh, quiet man. And my mother was very gregarious, had loads of friends, was a special friend of Firo LaGuardia, uh, was very active in the social life of, of New York during the war, 
greeting all of the uh, visitors from, from Europe, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, General de Gaulle, uh, all kinds of celebrities whom we met because we always got tickets to the huge receptions for them. I saved some of the tickets. Uh, please admit my, my, my cousin, who was my mother and family, were always, sometimes my parents sat on the, the dais at very special seats. And um, it was fun because we, we had a wonderful um, life, including all kinds of special events that the LaGuardias afforded us. As kids, we went to the circus, and we went to the bicycle races, and we went to the theater, and we uh, had a lot of uh, lovely adventures. Now, you wrote that he was a mentor to you. Yes, he was. How? Uh, in he, what way? He uh, had two adopted children. Jeannie, the older daughter, uh, was his niece his sister's child whom he adopted. And uh, Jeannie, who was about two years younger than Nikki and me, uh, was our friend. And she was a diabetic her whole life, a childhood uh, diabetic. Eric was a handsome Scandinavian boy adopted from an orphanage. And uh, there are pictures of my mother wheeling my younger sister Dorothy while uh, Mrs. LaGuardia uh, was wheeling Eric in the carriage. So the two ladies walked the carriages together on, along the park. But, um, now, were either of your parents musical? How did you yes. get into the and music? The, the mentorship was for each one of the girls. First, it was mostly in music. They encouraged our playing. I started out on the piano, and uh, as did all my, my other sisters. And then Dorothy, who was very gifted, continued on the piano, and uh, my twin and I took string instruments. I chose the cello, and she chose the violin. And so we had a trio at home at a young age. And when I say he encouraged us, he had my twin and I, maybe we were 13 or 14, playing with Ira Hirschman in a trio at the wedding of Lou Bold Morris at, at uh, Gracie Mansion. We were sitting, you know, two kids playing and my music teacher, my cello teacher arranged the wedding march and all these pieces uh, for us. He encouraged our music. He was most fond of my sister Dorothy, who was a wonderful pianist. And she was his poster child Every election, when he won, on the first one, she was three years old, he took a picture shaking Dorothy's hand on the stoop of my father's office. It was 1275 Fifth Avenue, the doctor's entrance to this building in Spanish Harlem. And um, that there's a picture of Dorothy age three, then Dorothy, if it was three years or four years, I'm not sure, he was elected mayor three times, and there's a picture of Dorothy shaking his hand each election day morning. And then, of course, my sister went to Bellevue Medical School, and uh, he was very encouraging to her. And she was young. I think she had some assistance getting in after just two years of college. But it was during the war, and she had taken three years of work and two years, and then at age 18 she was a medical student at Bellevue Medical College. And he said, you better succeed. She said, don't you be a breeder. I want you to succeed. He was very rough and tough. <laughs> How did you meet him? He lived in our building. Okay. He was a... Uh, Assemblyman, or uh, a member of the, of the uh, state legislature, I think. 
and lived in our building before he became mayor. And my mother and Marie Guardia became friends, and Fiorello really thought my mother was exceptional. Um, how would you just characterize your home in terms of Jewish affiliation? Or, uh, it was a, a Jewish home. My father's people were not religious Jews. My, my grandpa came over to this country at age 13. Uh, when his mother remarried. She had been a widow and had a new baby. And he was a follower of Louis Kossuth. He was a socialist. Jews were living in urban areas. He was a secular Jew. And uh, my grandpa Davis uh, wasn't uh, particularly observant. My mother's people were from Romania small time, town, maybe a shtetl. They were farmers. The name was Brandis, whether they were in the, you know, growing grapes or making wine, I'm not sure. Uh, but my grandpa, uh, Brandis, prayed every day, was very religious. I think he had a push cart or some kind of a uh, selling, selling uh, clothing, uh, very poor and um, modest uh, household. And when my grandmother um, entertained, it was a tremendous gathering. There were seven children, all those grandchildren and husbands. And she cooked up a storm and she made individual chalice in, a, in, in an old uh, cold, cold stove, uh, oven, uh, and uh, we had loads of customs for uh, Tell us a little about your education. I went to PS6 Manhattan, which was out of the district, uh, because we lived on 109th Street. And Fifth Avenue and all of the schools in that neighborhood were mainly schools with, with Spanish kids. I don't think so many black people yet were in that neighborhood. And naturally, with, with the mayor uh, insisting on it, uh, we went to school with a, another kid or two in our building, another Jewish kid. Uh, to down to 85th Street and Madison Avenue to PS6. Which was now a very good very school. A very fine school. <laughs> we were one of very few kids who didn't go home for lunch. We stayed there. My mother drove us to elementary school, as I say, maybe four kids in our building, uh, whom Fiorello uh, wanted to have that opportunity of being in that school. And uh, we brought our lunch, and we, I guess, played in the playground. We were free to, to walk around, because there was a Wayland, and if I had a dime, we'd get three for 10, you know, candy, uh, if I ever had any, any uh, money for a big splurge at lunchtime. So uh, that was my elementary school. In high school, we went to music and art, all of us, Dorothy as well. Uh, Dorothy went to, we had moved by the time she was in elementary school, and my younger sister, Dorothy, went to PS9, which was just across the street from where we lived, on 82nd Street in West End Avenue. PS9 was, <laughs> she could roll out of bed. <laughs> what was it like having a twin sister? Well, it, I, I had a companion my whole life. Uh, I just had a, somebody very close, just like me. And, um, in the beginning, when we were young, we dressed alike, and we had fun with that. We dressed alike all through high school, and um, 
we exchange classes, fool around. I'd go to orchestra and pretend I could play the violin. She'd, uh, uh, we, we had fun on April Fool's Day. Uh, it was nice having a twin. And all three of you were muse interested in music. We, we all played music. My father had played the violin and my mother had played the piano and they encouraged us to practice. Uh, kind of made us practice the piano. I didn't like that. That's why I threatened to quit lots of times, but I always loved the cello and never threatened to quit it because I picked that instrument myself. And after high school, you went to college? And after high school, <laughs> I graduated very young. I was 16. And uh, we had thought of, or maybe I thought of going away to college. It was every kid's fantasy. But my mother was very protective of my father. And she kept saying, don't stress your father. Don't you ask for anything difficult. Um, and um, I'm not sure it's much too difficult to send you away. I'm not sure if I really would have wanted to go. I was offered a, a partial scholarship uh, from Smith College because I was a cellist and I guess could play in that orchestra. So I'm not sure that that was my mother's reasoning was uh, really a, a true objection. But in any case, we were young, and I was studying with a very fine teacher at Manhattan School of Music, um, studying cello, and um, started out at Queens College, which uh, would be out of, out of district except for graduates of music and art, because they were developing a very fine music department. And I stayed there a couple of years, and loved the school, but I transferred to Hunter because it was too bigger commute and I was practicing and uh, taking music classes at Manhattan School of Music as well. By that time that school had grown and was giving more courses and was giving a Bachelor of Music degree and uh, so I got my bachelor's degree from Hunter and then I um, uh, about a year after I graduated I decided I would like to become a teacher because I didn't have success uh, as being an instrumentalist. I knew I could never be a soloist, I wasn't good enough, and I had auditioned for orchestras and it didn't appeal to me to play in an orchestra and be away from the family. So I decided to study to be a teacher and I went back to Queens College and had to take all the undergraduate education courses. It took two years to get the uh, Master of Arts in Music Education. And that's when I became a teacher. Now, we, when did you meet your husband and get married? Uh, my twin was married young. Uh, she married one of those boys who was in the car with us going to <laughs> PS6. And he was a physician or a medical student at the time she uh, became engaged. And then uh, she married him. And uh, Marty was an intern at. Uh, I guess it was Willett Parker Hospital. It was a hospital that's long gone for infectious diseases. And that's where the polio epidemic, all of the patients with polio were treated at Willett Parker. And it was, it was really a very depressing place to visit. Marty was very sociable, and, um, like my sister, but she was married. So she said, well, there's another one at home like me. So that's how I met him. Uh, I had been in Europe visiting Casals. Uh, and when she told me, said he'd like to meet me, and my sister said, well, Vicky's in Europe. Uh, I went to Eastern Pyrenees with a, with a 
heavy case of records from the Bach Aria group given me by Bernard Greenhouse, a cellist from the Bach Aria group, and he said, bring these to Casals as a gift uh, from me. And I had an amazing uh, experience summer in Europe. I traveled alone. Uh, and when I came back, Marty loved music, and he invited me, he had a double date with a physician and his wife, uh, guess another intern, and we went to hear a program for 92nd Street Y, uh, the uh, violin and oboe concerto by Bach. I remember the program vividly, and Mitch Miller played the, the oboe, if you could believe this. Um, and that was our first date. And when Marty brought me home, he said, this is the most wonderful time I've ever had. Well, so I wasn't, I don't remember if I felt that, but then the next day, my sister tells me at Bellevue, um, Marty walked up halfway up the steps and he said, Mickey, and the boys weren't allowed to go up to the girls' floor. And so all the boys followed him, were on the stairs wanting to see what was happening. And then uh, Mickey came and all the girls came to see. Oh, I guess that's when he said, I had a most wonderful time. So um, that's how, I, that's how I, I met Marty and he loved music. He played the violin. He never learned to read music. He had a poor teacher, but he could play by ear. And one of his favorite activities when he was entertaining at home was to pull out the violin, play it upside down or inside out, and then he, he played humorous, dum 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 dum, dum uh, in, a, in a you know with the bow upside down or the fiddle up. Uh, but he. He really loved music. And when did you get married? And we got married in, in uh, July 1st, 1951. And when did you come to Stanford? Uh, we, we got married and Marty was still in training. He had about a year or so to go. I was teaching by that time at uh, the High School of Music and Art. I didn't get that job right away, but six months into teaching, they were looking for someone to teach cello. It was a specialized school, and asked me to, to uh, take that position, which I loved. Um, and uh, so we were married the first I was teaching about a year uh, when we married. And uh, when he was finished with his residency, he was looking for a place in, in the suburbs. He didn't like New York. He wasn't a New York city boy. Uh, and so he spent quite a bit of time researching communities nearby, uh, making appointments in advance with the director of the hospital or various physicians to find out about the city. Uh, or uh, the economy, or if there was a shortage of doctors, or how good the hospital was, and we we made several trips uh, the, the year before we settled on Stanford. Stanford was just bursting. Uh, the Merritt Parkway, Dr. Heinrich told us at, at our lovely chat, uh, he said the only way they could keep people away from Stanford was to put barricades on. Uh, he said that the doctors can barely take care of their patients. He recommended it highly. We had lunch at the kosher delicatessen and that settled the case. <laughs> Marty decided it was a splendid town and we moved here. By that time we had a um, one child, Dan, who was about a year and a half old. Stanford in um, 1954. Okay, and then you had some more children. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had some more children. Now, you didn't say what kind of a physician Marty was. He, he was an internist. That, that's uh, really general medicine. And um, he was a uh, very unique physician in that he listened to his patients and he was beloved by his patients. And he uh, I, I guess doctors don't exist like that anymore. I think the world has changed. It has. So how many children did you have? I had I have five sons and um, Marty's yard site was uh, last week. And Sandy, my second son, the physician who practices in Stanford, uh, has been writing a blog lately since now his two children are in college, so he has time for a hobby. And it's a hobby like Marty had. Marty loved to write. And after Marty stroke, he, he had a word processor and he started with two fingers writing, you know, about his experiences his, uh, in practice and wonderful stories about his patients. Uh, Sandy has started a blog and um, last week uh, on his blog he printed the uh, eulogy he had given the Medical Society at the occasion of Marty's death. So that was in, that was in uh, 1994. Marty was 75, 70 years old. And uh, it was a wonderful eulogy, and I had looked at it in preparation for this interview. I had gotten out a lot of material, and I had read that eulogy, which was wonderful. And I, in addition to that eulogy, uh, which was delivered about a month after the funeral, to the, to the medical the meeting of the medical society. I also read Fred's eulogy. Fred is my number four son, and he's a rabbi. And he was a rabbi at the time of Marty's death. Uh, and it was a very beautiful eulogy. And when I mentioned to Fred this past week uh, that I have his eulogy, he told me that he only had one page of it. He said, how did you ever get it? Well, I said, Fred, you gave it to me, <laughs> and I saved it with important papers. But uh, in that eulogy, Fred asks his father what he would like to be remembered for, because Marty was very sick. Uh, and he said, surprisingly, maybe he was joking because he had was telling a lot of jokes all the time. He said, I'd like to be remembered for repopulating the earth. He said, luckily, mother could have a lot of children, and we were happy to have as many as God gave us. So, I have five sons. Now, you mentioned that one lives in Stamford. Three. The three Stamford. live in Stamford. Yes. My oldest son, Dan, is the one who was a year and a half when we came to Stanford. He's a lawyer, and his office is in the People's Bank building. Uh, his firm is Benjamin and Gold. Uh, my second son, we've discussed, Sanford H. Benjamin, has an office on Hoyt Street in the building that used to belong to Dr. Julie Levine. practices uh, uh, gastroenterology. My third son, Jim, who lives in Stanford, uh, is an entrepreneur and he does, what he's doing now is um, uh, renovations and, and uh, building uh, improvement, that type of thing. My fourth son lives in Milton, Massachusetts. Fred is a rabbi. And my fifth son, who was born 13 years after my oldest son, 
Bill. Uh, lives in California, and he's uh, a um, businessman. He worked uh, for the movies in the movie industry for a number of years, and uh, now he's working for a um, nonprofit organization called Healthy Child, Healthy World, and he's he is uh, very happy with that position because he has a new baby, adopted baby, uh, this beautiful chocolate co colored boy, white mother and uh, black father. And Bill says it's the first time that his work and his private life just have come together so beautifully. Would you like to take a little rest now? Okay. brought up in Stanford. And I'm curious, did you or your children ever face anti-Semitism in Stanford? Uh, it's interesting that when I spoke to Fred last week, uh, I asked him that question. And he told me that never in his life in Stanford had she never based anti-Semitism. He said when he had his railway religious conversion, in high school he started with in Sitsia, and uh, he said the only negative was a Jew who called him a kike, a dirty kike for that. He said the teacher, uh, his teacher, who told a black kid who was wearing a big hat to take it off, uh, and uh, the black kid said, what about Benjamin? He's wearing a hat. The teacher said, oh, that's a different kind of hat. Some Italian teacher. So he said, with his becoming very religious, uh, the, he, had, he had no negatives in terms of teachers, or no anti-Semitism, any of those. At all. And from my point of view, I never experienced anti Semitism. Uh, when I was growing up in New York, we lived in a Jewish neighborhood on the West Side. Uh, I loved Rabbi Milton Steinberg, the rabbi of the Park Avenue Synagogue. Uh, when I was first married, I taught Sunday school there. I also was the head of a, uh, of a girls' club. Uh, and uh, I always found uh, Rabbi Steinberg an inspiration to me and uh, got to know him. He was quite ill and died young. He had served in the Second World War and I sure got a discharge and a heart attack. And when I taught his son, second son, cello, at home, I would, and he'd be home resting, I had the chance to get to know him better personally. Uh, he was a very, very good man, very inspirational. He was active in the constructionist. So uh, I lived in a Jewish neighborhood in New York and Stanford. Part of the Jewish community joined Temple Beth El. I'm sure before the kids' dam was where they started religious Sunday school. I sent, um, not Dan because it didn't, school didn't exist, but by cultural school. Uh, day school was a big boom for me. I was doing all that driving, bar mitzvah time. And so each one of the boys sent to my cultural day school for numbers two, three, and four uh, for those bar mitzvah years so that they would get their religious training and really know what the bar mitzvah was all about. And I didn't have to do quite that much driving. Um, and Bill, my youngest, went to bicultural cultural day school from kindergarten till about fourth grade and then we took him out and uh, 
sent him to King's School because we felt there were too few uh, challenges socially. The same kids uh, who were there in kindergarten who were there in fourth grade and they didn't have a chance to really expand his uh, social uh, life. And so we put him in King's School and then he wanted to go to public high school. In terms of community, your community is well, really West Hill High School, not the one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be accurate. Yes. Um, would you like to talk a little about what you did at professionally and also what you were involved with in the community? Uh, I was involved in, in taking care of my children. It was very, very time consuming because I had so many for all at once. And uh, during all of those years, uh, when my kids were little, I would practice when they were asleep. So I couldn't wait for their nap time. And those who weren't napping knew it was nap time for the others. So, uh, because that was my practice time. And woe be when my husband decided to come home for lunch, he got it because that wasn't allowed. That was my practice time. So I, during those years, I played chamber music, quite a bit of chamber music. I was a member of the Sugar Club, which is the name of the local national federation of music clubs. They changed the name, it's not women's anymore, and it's music and dance club. And, uh, I was a member of their performing group, so that uh, they had a very active program for players, people like myself who wanted to perform, and once a month there was a concert. The, the meeting place was uh, down in Bedford Street where the old women's club was. There was an auditorium, if you remember, behind the women's club, which is no longer there. It's a bank. But uh, so that I played in a trio, uh, which uh, members of the Schubert Club, and we performed uh, there. I started doing some teaching. I had private students at home. Uh, later on, I joined the Norwalk Symphony because I really wanted the sociability. I was so stuck at home. I wanted to meet people. And that's where I met Joe. That might have been in the, um, he says he's known me 45 years. I'm not sure. Uh, it was a long time ago. Before that, I had been on the old symphony board. I had been asked to be on the board, but um, I wasn't excited. And uh, I decided I'd much rather play when they found it really new conductor Dennis Russell Davies that I would love playing the orchestra. So I was first cellist there, played in the orchestra, met Joe, and enjoyed the orchestra. And later I played in Stanford Symphony. I taught, uh, Tony Truly has started a program, Project Music. I taught at Project Music. I did some teaching of music at uh, Noble Community College. I taught a class in history and music. So I, I uh, played the Stanford Symphony and uh, trying to do as, as much playing uh, chamber music as, as possible and practiced every day. <laughs> I noticed you toured at Greenwich Public School. Well, I wasn't able to go back to teaching. I had taught at music and art until I became pregnant or until it showed enough so that they said I couldn't teach anymore. Those were the rules of the old days. And um, Marty got sick and uh, it was very important for me when he 
went back to practice to be there and help him out, make sure his schedule wasn't too heavy. And so I went back to work uh, as his secretary, sitting next to Mrs. Heimovich, who was secretary for Leo Heimovich. And um, uh, I was Monty's secretary till I became pregnant with Bill. And then after that, I really um, decided I never wanted to, to work with him because it was very, very difficult to, to be a wife and a, and a secretary. It, it really involved a lot of conflict. I couldn't do both well. So I, I, I felt he didn't need me as secretary anymore. And uh, as soon as Bill was in about second grade uh, uh, by cultural day school, I applied for a job. I think Marty had gotten sick again uh, to, to teach in the British public schools because I didn't want to have the same students as perhaps he had patients. So, uh, with him working in the Stanford community, I, I thought I'd better be teaching in the French public schools. So I taught there half time for 20 years. Started at age 47 and retired at age 67. Sounds like a very productive life. Are there any other comments you'd like to make about the Stanford community? And particularly, I guess, the Jewish community, but just in general, comparing it to New York or comparing it to what you thought you, your needs were? Or Yes. I think that in Stanford, the Jewish community played a much larger role uh, in our lives than, than if we had lived in New York. When my boys were little, they all went to the Jewish Center. They all took gym and swim on Sunday. Um, and all of them studied swimming in Phyllis School, Len's wife, who was everybody's swimming teacher. Uh, the Jewish Center, the nursery school, the two older boys went to the nursery school that today is called the Sarah Water Nursery School. Uh, the Jewish Center had a wonderful camp that Fred enjoyed and was a counselor. Loved being a counselor at that camp. Um, Fred told me that the Jewish Center was closed, he said, for 10 years. Uh, I didn't remember that it was closed that long. But he said that they had sold the Jewish Center and that the building program stopped because of the 67 war contributions redirected to Israel rather than to the Jewish Center. Uh, I haven't remembered that um, uh, there was that much dislocation in his social life, but apparently the Jewish Center was a, uh, a very important focus uh, for my boys uh, before they got to, to high school. In high school, all of them played ice hockey, Enjoyed the Roxbury um, ice ice skating club, and uh, I, I don't know if the Jewish Center was as critical in their lives, but the Temple Beth El uh, must know the Benjamin name because we're the only family that has five boys, all bar mitzvah at Temple. And was that all with uh, Rabbi Goldman? Uh, no. Uh, a lot of different rabbis. Okay. There was a young rabbi who uh, stayed about three years and left. Um, I don't remember his name, but his wife was emotionally ill and he found the pressure of that job uh, too great. And I believe he was the rabbi at Sandy's. Uh, a very uh, lovely young fellow, 
and then um, our current rabbi, Rabbi Hammond. Rabbi Hammond. I believe was the most rabbi for the girls' department. So I think that Rabbi Goldman might have been the rabbi for two of the departments. So we have, we've had uh, a number of rabbis. Okay. Uh, now I noticed that you wrote down about uh, making mention or videoing your little award, the outstanding from the Outstanding Woman of Connecticut Award in 2003. Tell us I'm so happy you brought it up because uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Ruth Cohn, Ruth Steinfeld's Cohn, as being one of the most uh, brilliant uh, and inspiring uh, friends I've ever had. Uh, Ruth Steinfeld's came from uh, a family whose father was the president of Bridgeport Brass, Steinkraus, German family, uh, that Ruth late in life married her Cohn, a lawyer, a Jewish man, that she was very, very active in the United Nations and uh, really put Westport on the map for the hospitality program to United Nations employees and, and not just the ambassador secretaries, supporters who came to um, um, Westport for, for um, special events. And she had a program uh, in which she uh, had, I guess, for holidays, for Thanksgiving or Christmas, she had foreign employees of the United Nations stay in people's homes. And she's founded with her home, the Friends of Music, Westport Friends of Music, uh, had wonderful concerts in the um, Unitarian Church in Westport, beautiful concerts, and she was the angel uh, that was supporting that program. And Ruth was a magnificent musician, a wonderful pianist, brilliant woman. She, I think, read a book a day. I've uh, never seen such a gracious reading. Uh, and she, she thought I was the cat's meow. Uh, she thought I, I was the best. So having a friend like that uh, was really a huge boon to me. And we had some uh, great music. We played piano trios. She's a pianist. We played piano quartets. Her brother, uh, Bill Steinkraus, who's a well-known uh, equestrian, uh, was a friend of another violist whom I played with, Bill Selden. And Yale University, Bill Selden was Jewish and Although he was in the same class as Bill Steinkraus, Steinkraus wouldn't look at him. He was a Jew, and Bill felt very much uh, handicapped as a Jew. But we played Mozart, two viola uh, quintets with Bill Steinkraus and Bill Selman, each one with a very famous old Italian fiddle, comparing their instruments and talking like friends and pretending maybe I'm Bill Steinkraus' part that it's okay to talk to a Jew. But Ruth was really a magnificent woman. And uh, she had this award, Outstanding Woman of Connecticut, which she insisted that I that I be nominated for. And, and I said, look, Ruth, I said, I, I, this is for working for international peace. This is working for international justice. I said, I, I, there's nothing that I do that conforms to the requirements. No, she said, you, you've done all these amazing things. So uh, I, that award was given after her death because she died in, in about 2000. 
2002, and uh, a committee of people whom she knew, she was active, very active in Westport, in music and the arts. And, uh, they arranged in 2003 to, to give out the awards, and I do have um, uh, a statement which I wrote, uh, because she made me do it, uh, of all the important things that, that I, I've done. Uh, certainly not to help the world, but maybe a small portion of <laughs> You haven't said anything about your interest in art, and I know that you were chosen. Well, I, I have so, a, huge, a, a huge affinity to, uh, to art because it's aesthetics. Uh, art and music have a great deal in common, and people who are not literal, as music is literal, art is literal, can generally make a, a crossover. So when I retired, I was looking for something to do, and uh, so I volunteered to go down to the Whitney Champion, and I was sitting there at the desk, and answering the telephone, it didn't ring much, and uh, receiving a visitor who didn't come often. And I thought, what is this waste of time? And I met a lovely woman, a uh, retired art teacher, black woman, uh, who said to me, you should be a docent. I said, well, I never thought of it. I didn't go to art school. I never took, well, she said, apply for it. And so there were requirements. I had to take a, a couple of courses or read a few books, and I enjoyed being a docent until that building was sold in five or seven years. And then I went down to the um, Newburger Museum, and I enjoyed being a docent there until I could uh, sit on a, <laughs> a little stool and <laughs> Really a very long and productive life. It's so nice to talk to you. Any last reflections? Well, I had spoken to Dan, my oldest son, uh, and asked him what he thought the Jewish Historical Society would be interested in. And he said he thought that they would be interested in who our friends were. When we were when we were uh, young married, uh, when our children were growing up, uh, he thought we would be interested in that we were very friendly with Jimmy Rubin, Seal, the Shrine, Fetters, um, He he thought that the the um, uh, association. With with uh, Jewish you know the Jewish community uh, would, would interest you, but um, we were friends with them until we were able to keep up with them anymore because of the, uh, the illness in our family. I thank you for giving your time to this project. Well, I've enjoyed it.